What's the word, y'all? I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't think I was gonna be able to make this video. I am as sick as can be. But the Boston Celtics became one of the few teams in NBA history to be down 0-3 to force a game seven. So I gotta do what I gotta do. So if there's an abnormal amount of cuts in this, that's because I gotta clear my throat, I gotta drink some water, whatever. The, the, the show must go on. Now, they wanted a few teams to force a game seven or be a down no three, but they have an advantage that none of those other previous teams have, and we got to talk about that. After we talk about the Enjoy Basketball Newsletter, ladies and gentlemen, we drop Monday, Wednesday, Friday, all things NBA. I know right now it's not super tough to keep up with the league considering we're down to our last couple games of the entire year, but throughout the course of the NBA season, Enjoy Basketball Newsletter is a way to keep up with the league in the best way possible. We almost got 50,000 newsletter uh, readers, which is crazy to say aloud because again, we're talking about newsletters that go to the email. I didn't know that the market was like this and I'm just putting you on game before I get, well, it's never going to be too late, but you want to be in on the ground floor. We also have a writer one time a week that's that's writing about the W. So it is Enjoy Basketball. It's not just the NBA. So hit the link in the description Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You get your newsletters, read them up and let me know what you think. All right. If you watched the game yesterday, you know what that advantage that the Boston Celtics have because they said it on the broadcast maybe five to six times. All the other teams that were down 0-3 and forced the game seven, they didn't have that game seven on their home court. Now, the Boston Celtics for the last couple of seasons haven't been this Golden State warrior S team at home uh, in the playoffs, at least in the playoffs. Their record at home is staggeringly bad. I think it's around 500. And you got to remember that this is a team that has been one of the top seeds for the last couple of seasons. So the fact that they struggle at home where they are 500 team in the playoffs, it's going to play a part or it has played a part. How big of a part would it play in game seven? I, I don't know. Because in the last series, uh, the, the home court was something. They they ran the Philadelphia 76ers out of the gym behind a, a magnificent game from Jason Tatum. Again, the, the Miami Heat are a different monster when it comes to the small intangible things in basketball. Something that the, the Philadelphia 76ers feel like they were lacking. So it's not it shouldn't be that easy. But elimination game Tatum seems to be a thing. And, and this is saying something because they were up by 10-ish points with like four or five minutes to go. And they allowed the Miami Heat to get right back into that game. And in that fourth quarter, we got we to look at the Boston Celtics fans. It was not a pretty show. The Jason Tatum ended up with like six points in the second half completely. And not a lot of those was coming in the fourth quarter. But the course of history changed in just 0 0.1 seconds, which is crazy. Now, the Boston Celtics already are going to have some difficult conversations this offseason, whether they win the championship or lose this game seven, because, of course, Jalen Brown is up for that Supermax extension. That's $300 million. And do you want to have $600 million between Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, just two players on your roster? You got the second curtain thing coming at the end of next season. It's a lot of conversations for the Boston Celtics to figure out how to build the championship team, because they've been able to build the championship contender for the better half of a decade. But we're talking about championship team now. Did they get this game seven? Those conversations are going down the line just a little bit later. And now with them having this game seven and the home court advantage where the Miami Heat team that we're seeing right now looks dramatically different than the Miami Heat team we saw the first three games of the series for the five games of the last series and for the five games of the series before that. And a lot of that boils down to their star level play. In a game six, I want to make sure I get my numbers right. I want to make sure I get my numbers right. You got 21 points from Caleb Martin. You got 10 points from Max Struess. You got 15 from Gabe Vincent. You got eight from Kyle Lowry. And I think all eight of those came in the second half. You got Duncan Robinson in the fourth quarter scoring 10 of his 13 points. That is the, the production that you want from outside of your top two players. But now you had your top two players not showing up to work. I know Jimmy Butler ended up with 24 points, 11 rebounds, 8 assists. If you watch that game, that, that wasn't a Jimmy Butler performance that we've seen earlier in the series or in the last series. I know that, well, damn, I didn't realize he shot four of 16. Sheesh. I mean, in the paint alone, the Boston Celtics had them on clap. I think they shot 30% from the field in, in the in the painted area. That's supposed to be the easiest shot in basketball. Not with Rob Williams down there. I guess not with Al Horford down there. And what scares me a little bit is that this might have been the game for the role players to play their best ball. And now you go back to Boston where you can't really rely on those role players to have those great performances. My boy D. Mills I always say role players play better at home. And I, I, again, I ain't never looked up the statistics to prove that to be right or wrong, specifically with the Miami Heat. But again, Caleb Martin has such a good game. Gabe Vincent hit his shots. Duncan Robinson. Oh, Duncan Robinson has the looks at the end of the game. But I can't be mad at Duncan because he was one of the main reasons why that 10-point deficit that you had in that four minutes were down to zero and that you eventually had the lead. But we mentioned it after last game. There are just times throughout the course of Jimmy Butler's career where his whole objective is to draw the foul. And he's one of the best in the game at it, right? If you look at total free throws, he's towards the top. Like, that's the thing he does. And in this game alone, he ended up with 14 free throw attempts. Like, that's part of his game. And I'm not uh, discrediting him for that. 
but eventually you got to put the ball in the basket. There are a lot of possessions in this game where Jimmy Butler didn't even touch the ball. Now, I'm not saying that everything has to be ran through your star player. I mean, I don't know if that's the recipe for success, but we're talking stretches of the game when Jimmy Butler's not involved whatsoever. And in the fourth quarter, he had 15 points, which is great. I mean, he ended up shooting eight to 10 free throws in the fourth quarter. There was a lot, a lot of free throws in this game. And again, another one of the reasons why they were able to come back from down 10 but it also felt like he was not looking at the basket as nearly as much as you want him to do. I like how level-headed everybody is uh, in the post game or with, with Jimmy Butler saying he gonna smoke him some cigs, have a beer, and get ready for the next game. I like how level-headed that is. I like how Eric Spolstra, um did something he don't normally do, which is come to the podium and, and not guarantee anything. But it's rare to see Eric Spolstra say something like, we're gonna figure this out and we'll be, we'll be back in the finals, or whatever the exact quote was. That's not something that Eric Spolstra normally does. So we'll see. Because this has gone from a Cinderella story that, that is one of the best stories in ball to like, they could be the first team out of 180, I think the number is, to blow the 3-0 lead, which is insane. 0.1 seconds is all it took. Um, and I've seen a lot of conversations on Twitter about specifically Matt Struess on the inbound, uh, where if you look at Matt Struess, he leaves the inbounder and that allows Derek White to cut straight to the basket for the tip in. And in defense of Matt Struess, I will say it seemed like the game plan was to deny Jason Tatum. So when Jason Tatum flared up to get the ball, he went to prevent for, for Tatum. And it seemed like the right idea. Marcus Smart, again, is in a position to win or go home, big shot in the playoffs. Which is, I don't know how it's always Marcus Smart. But he missed the ball so perfectly that, like, Derek White got a V-line straight to the basket for a tip in. But because Max Strews had went to deny the ball there with Tatum, there was no time for recovery, which means there was no box out on Derek White. And there was also no box out on the other side because if the ball were to miss the other way, I mean, Tatum was there for the tip in. I mean, you got to put a body on these people, but it seemed like, I mean, you're running the zone. One of the major things about a zone is it's hard to put a body on somebody for a box out, and that's, that's the hill that you died on. There's also a lot of stuff I saw about the amount of time that was added to the clock because when Jimmy Butler shot his free throw, it was at 2.1 second. They went back to review it and they gave another nine tenths of a second on the clock to make it three seconds. And they're saying this is this what makes it real. I, I, listen, I, I never understand this part of the game. And, and I'm not talking about it from like, I, I don't know. It feels like, and I've been guilty of this as well, so I'm not singling any fan base out or anything like that. When you lose a game like this, you want to do everything in your power to point the finger at something. And after that game, I'm not speaking for all Miami Heat fans, but for a lot of fans I saw on the timeline, they gave it to the fact that the amount of time was added to it. And I rewatched the Jimmy Butler foul on Al Horford about as many times as anybody could. The, the referees got it right. But to think it would potentially be rigged for it to perfectly land in Derek, you know how many factors played a part in Derek White getting that lay getting that tip in it was more than just having the extra zero point whatever seconds it was a lack of a box out it was the denying of jason tatum it was the zone defense it was a hard cut from Derek white and jason tatum where they're like no matter what i'm not just gonna stand around and let nothing happen and, and they had to be the perfect perfect miss you know what i'm saying so i can't look at the fact that there's extra time on the clock and say Dang, we should be in the NBA Finals right now. Instead of looking in the mirror and saying, hey, our star player has to do better in the last or the first three and a half quarters. Our all-star center, our all-defensive center, got to shoot more than 30% from the field when he's just taking layups and mid-race jump shots. It's not that there was extra time on the clock. This was a winnable game, and your star players didn't come through. You had two shots on the other side from Duncan Robson. He was wide, wide open. He was so open on the first one that he took his time. He dribbled the ball. He, he even said he tested the air in the arena. It's a missed shot. It's basketball, you know? He's one of the better three-point shooters in all of the league. It's basketball. And it's not just a rigging against the Miami. That's not the way it's working. That's it. That's all I really got to say. Hopefully by tomorrow, the day after, I feel 100% so I can really get into my bag. But I, I am I'm pretty sure that once this camera goes off, my voice is going to be gone again. So I appreciate y'all watching.